Hey everyone, thanks so much for being here and for continuing to watch the videos that we're sending out. If you are a recurring donor of 1128, it's important that I say thank you on a regular basis. This is one way in which we can express that thanks uh, in a way in which we hope we can add some value to you and your own life and your own world. Now, as you know, Enneagram is important uh, to the conversations that we have with spiritual formation and with, with uh, spiritual growth. And I've had the benefit and the blessing of being part of the I don't know, the coolest uh, Enneagram cohort ever in history with any teacher ever. Um, and one wonderful person that I met during that time was Melissa. Melissa, thanks so much for being with us today. Tell me a little bit about yourself, and uh, I'd love to know more about kind of your experiences in life and maybe what brought us here to this point. Yeah, well, I first of all want to just say if anyone ever has a chance to do a cohort with Suzanne, you should. Um, but yes, Trey and I have our group has already claimed the coolest cohort ever tag. So, you know, but you can be the second coolest cohort. <laughs> yeah, I think the second coolest, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Melissa Corkum and my husband Patrick and I live just north of Baltimore and we are an adoptive family and I'm actually also an adoptee. So adoption has been a big part of our family's story. And back in 2018, uh, I had the privilege of co-founding an organization called the Adoption Connection, and we provide post-placement resources to adoptive and foster families, uh, and that just came out of our story. It's taught us a lot about um, trauma, both big T traumas, little T traumas, complex traumas, about grief and loss, about how to love others well, and part of that journey is uh, my friend Lisa and I, who run this together also are Enneagram coaches and the Enneagram. One of the cool things about us is Lisa is also a birth mom and I'm an adoptee and we're both adoptive moms. So we make up all three parts of the triad and the Enneagram has been just invaluable in helping us process stories, both our stories, our kids stories, the people we serve, the families we serve. And so, yeah, I'm trying, I'm really grateful for a chance to chat with you and help other those that are listening in whatever way I can. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. It's been fun to, to get to know you over the last year. And as fellow aggressive numbers, uh, which for those of you who are scratching your head a little bit, remember aggressive numbers are the three, seven, and eight. And they share things in common, like a, a future-oriented looking at the world. Uh, we tend to be the kind who repress our feelings instead of really uh, engage that and, uh, you know, admit that they're even there. Uh, and we, uh, we share some things in common in that way. And that's allowed us in our conversation, um, to really try to better understand the common messages that we receive that shape who we are. And the Enneagram tells us, Hey, these are the messages we need to hear. So Melissa, you've been doing this for a while as a coach, uh, and also just kind of in, putting that into work in your own family. Um, let's maybe sure let's make sure that our, our listeners, our watchers um, know some of the key messages that we need to hear that the Enneagram can provide for us. Yeah, so you know when we're thinking about dominant types or what motivates us, there's a lot of talk in Enneagram literature around childhood messages. Sometimes they're like, wounding or injury messages. So either um, on purpose, unfortunately, in some cases, or just accidentally, you know, sometimes we mess up as humans and as parents and our kids get this message based on their dominant Enneagram type. They're kind of predisposed to hear a message. And then there's kind of counter messages to those injury messages, you know, kind of like what each person's heart longs to hear. And I found that those are super, super important, especially when we're, you know, we work with a lot of um, kids who have complex trauma or have come to their families through adoptions. So there's a lot of talk around belonging and, and how we help them with things like self-esteem. And so, you know, one important thing in the Enneagram is that it's a super personal journey. So while it's super tempting to type everyone and their brother around us and our spouses and our kids and really we're doing it because we want the best for them. It's not super, super helpful. Um, but what I tell people is the great thing about the Enneagram, even though it's incredibly complex and so helpful is also there's only nine dominant types, which means 
there's really only nine dominant messages that people are really longing to hear. And so if we know those well, then we can, especially in our kids' lives, be intentional about letting them hear that in different ways, either through our words or through our actions or the, you know, and, and then we'll make sure we're covering all of our bases. Cause we don't have to know their type to just, and there are things that we all need to know, right. Cause we all have a little bit of every type. And so we don't have time to do all nine, but some of the themes of them are themes like, you know, our, our kids need to know that they're good, you know, that they're good because God made them, um, not sinless good, but like just valuable good, you know, our, we need to be known and loved and heard regardless of our actions, what we're accomplishing, how we're behaving. That, that seems to be a, a theme in a lot of the messages. Um, we need to know that we'll be taken care of, that our needs aren't a problem and that we matter. And, you know, some of you are probably thinking, well, duh, 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 like, of course, right? But there's so many ways as parents, when we're frustrated or as humans, when we're in relationship, uh, that we don't always send that message across, you know, with the way that we're in relationship with other people. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, there's, there is kind of a duh element to the Enneagram, right? It's like, well, of course that's the way life is, but it can get a little more complex when we talk about that personal journey, right? Each one, each person has some nuances in that, that make them unique, uh, in who they are and how they express the image of God. Um, but also that, creates that space into which we, that hole into which we really need to find people who will fill that and who will be the spirit of God in that space for us, um, that, that hopefully in that healing way. So if you've known me long enough, um, folks who are watching, you know that the kid life crisis, which is kind of one of those phrases we use, that childhood wound, I used to think for a long time that was the death of my dad. Uh, like the death itself, uh, which of course it's a, a, a life altering uh, event. But what I have discovered through the Enneagram is that the childhood wound, the kid life crisis was actually not that moment. It was the moment as I was leaving the funeral, when I had this internal content, co uh, conflict about what I really felt and what I was supposed to feel based upon what the church and family had told me. Um, instead of messages like, I'm sad, I don't know what to do, I'm angry. I, instead, it was, we'll help you through. Don't worry. There will be other people who fill that gap, and you shouldn't have to worry or grieve forever because those, will, those holes will be filled for you, right? And so the wound for me was this, this moment where I had this Oh, I could not figure out what to do with those emotions, uh, which is a very common thing for a type three to be both all the feels and to have all of these feelings and yet not admit them, repress them, push them down. Melissa, what about you? What has that been like for you? If you don't mind sharing a little bit of your kid life crisis or your childhood wound, how has that impacted your story? Well, first, before I start, I think what's so important and interesting about that experience for you, Trey, is like none of the people that where you picked up that message from were necessarily doing or saying the wrong things. Like they were trying to be encouraging. Those things like categorically aren't injuring or bad things. And that's kind of where my story starts. So I identify as a type seven and the, the message that a seven supposedly receives in childhood is um, or the, that we need to hear is that your needs will be taken care of. And when I first heard that, I was like, well, I don't, I don't really get that. I don't really resonate with that because on a surface level, I grew up in a very loving Christian home. We always had what we needed. My parents were loving and caring. There was a lot of like outward affection, hugs, like I love yous, all those things. So, you know, I couldn't, figure out like, why would that be the message that I would be carrying around or that I would really need to hear? And as I reflected on it more, so, you know, as Trey mentioned earlier, uh, three sevens and eights, a little bit more independent, a little bit more assertive, if you will. And my parents, neither one of them are in that 
stance. So uh, my mom identifies as a nine, my dad probably a six. Um, and so both completely different than how, you know, more aggressive stances move through the world. And I was super driven, um, not unlike a three, right, to, to do all the things, wanted to be a doctor when I was little, like did really well in school, was always looking for extracurriculars, always like driving to be at the top. And, um, but my parents never were the driving force behind all of that. The message that we heard from very young was, we love you for exactly who you are. Um, you don't have to get A's in school. Like it's all about the effort. Um, you know, if you go to college, great. If you don't, great. Like, and all of that is great parenting, right? Like it doesn't sound like terrible parenting, but the message that I received because I was driven and like, because my basic needs were met, the next layer of need was like to be supported in this drive. And I, I didn't feel like they didn't support me because they, they for sure were like, yeah, like you go for it. But they also weren't um, like, they weren't, they weren't with me in driving it. Right. So I felt like they're not going to get me to the top college. Like I have to get there myself. Like they're going to cheer me on from the sidelines, but like, they're not going to meet the need that I have to be like neck and neck with someone like being pushed, being driven. Um, and so I think that's where it comes out for me. And again, tricky, right? Because they didn't categorically do anything wrong. But I think, again, just like threes are prone to hearing a certain message, regardless of what's going on in the world, sevens are prone to hearing a certain message, regardless of what's going on in the world. And I think that's what's so interesting when we think about, you know, the fact that I do believe we're kind of born with this core motivation and it, and it does shape and create a confirmation bias for everything that happens to us. Yeah, absolutely. I love the way you, I love the way you put that, the confirmation bias, that the, the childhood wound, the, the crisis, the moment of truth, if you will, that we can look back on and see a, a turn in some ways may just be an acceleration of what was already there. Uh, a, a push down the hill, if you will, of a message that we had been uh, born with and a part of us that had been very much ingrained into our very genetic being. And to have that moment, push it down the hill, if you will. I, I like that, the confirmation bias that comes from that. That's, that's a great, that's great language. I may borrow that um, in some of my conversations. Yeah, well, um, it's not my language, so <laughs> borrow away. <laughs> <laughs> so when we what happens when we don't get the message we need though? Uh, it, it seems like, uh, as you said, none of those are ill-intended. Those, those childhood messages that, that we receive and that wound us, are, they're not ill-intended most of the time. Um, so what do we do about that? If, we, if we're discovering that childhood message, what can I do to, if, do I mitigate that? Do I fix that? Um, do I reverse the effects of that? Melissa, what do I do with the knowledge that I've got this childhood wound that is shaping who I am now? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, it's really easy for us to, with so much research and new brain science and all those things, to think that there is something out there that can fix us. Like if we do enough talk therapy, if we do enough EMDR, if we do enough neurofeedback, you know, that we can kind of fix ourselves to be the version of what we want. Uh, but I think the Enneagram gives us permission to be exactly who we are. Like we don't have to be like everyone else. Uh, we all have a shadow side and a superpower. And, and then also, I think just remembering, like pressing into just the beginning of who we were created to be, who we were created by and all of that, because I think you know, the in scripture are the answers to all of those missing pieces when humans can't do it all for us, you know, in our own personal journey, like that's the kind of the mystery in it all is we, there's nothing we can do to fill all of those gaps to make all of those things better. Um, ultimately it's, you know, our personal journey and relationship with God. And then that can fill all of those things. And trust me, I've tried all the, I mean, I've literally tried all the things. So, you know, take it from someone who's really tried hard to make it 
you know, God plus all the other things. And not that all the other things aren't helpful, but um, if you don't have the God first piece, you know, you can be on a treadmill running and running and feel like you're not getting any traction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if I look at, you know, maybe just maybe uh, there is an opportunity for us to examine the little T trauma, the, the little W wounds along the way. I, I want to be a better parent. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better pastor. Um, how can the Enneagram help me uh, navigate the minefield um, that is each individual's personal needs, wounds, and messages that are both a blessing or a curse to them? Yeah. Well, I love Suzanne's question that she asks all the time. And I've literally figured out how to apply this to pretty much everything in my life, which is what is mine to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think starting there is what is ours to do is to be the best version of ourselves. I think the Enneagram hands down in my story has been the number one, most helpful, tangible piece of what does that even look like? Because I think it does look different for each of us based on our core motivations. Like there are practices that um, are better for fast movings, threes, sevens, and eights. Uh, and there are practices that are more helpful to, you know, more tethered to the past, like nines, fours, and fives, you know, um, like the, the thought exercises, the journaling exercises that are more helpful for me as a future focused person kind of need to force me to look backwards, do examine, do those types of things. And then I think like for my mom, like she needs to have practice about like vision for the future, you know, and not being tethered. So I think focusing on ourselves, um, because that's what we ultimately have control over and the return on investment for the effort that we'll put into changing ourselves is way better than if we put it into changing any other person. Uh, and again, as a recovering control freak, uh, <laughs> I, I know this firsthand cause I've literally tried to control and change all the people in my life at some point in time. And I think the other part is just grace for ourselves. I think, you know, if you're listening to the stories of Trey and me, then you're thinking, um, like, I can't, I can't get anything right. You know, like, how am I ever going to, you know, like, can I ever, you know, I could be a great parent and my kid could still be picking up, you know, this, this confirmation bias on his childhood message. Um, you know, the research says that we just need to get it right. Like 30% of the time in terms of being attuned and being present, we'll mess it up a third of the time. And then we spend the rest of the third of the time repairing, you know, what we've messed up. And so I think, there's also a lot of room for grace and God and a lot of that and just being aware, right. We can do with what we know. We can't change what's happened in the past. We can do better once we know better. And um, yeah. And we, we have all those messages and also because of we live in a fallen world and because of the confirmation bias of all the types, like you just can't be the perfect parent, friend, coworker, spouse, but we can still be intentional in, you know, am I giving people voice? Am I attuning to what they may need? Like some people might need you to go toe to toe with them and be a little bit more driven. And some people might need you to, you know, back off. And some people need a little bit more pushing and like for ones, they certainly don't need any more criticism in their life. So I think just being attuned to kind of the relationships that you're in and just think we don't all need the same things and what is there a possible message that I think might be missing in this situation and how can I communicate that again not just in words but you know potentially in how I'm relating to this person yeah I like that a lot what is mine to do I uh I'm always reminded of something that uh Suzanne said as well but one of the first things I heard her say was that the Enneagram teaches us to be curious about ourselves and to show compassion to ourselves, uh, that we can, it gives us things to look into and ask questions about, but ultimately not to judge or critique or play down any of those things, but to say, okay, I can walk alongside that. And that's who I am. I can, I can learn what is beneath that. That's something beautiful that as God created is beneath all of that, but also to be compassionate about it because there is beauty in each of the nine types. Um, and I, I love that about uh, the Enneagram. It gives us permission to do that. 
maybe it's me, but I tend to think that if we can give ourselves that permission, it makes it easier for other people to also give us that permission. And that creates a very healthy cycle between the two. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's blurred and grayed a lot of lines that I thought were really black and white and kind of pretty strong for most of my life. And, and it's, in some ways it was really scary when I first kind of jumped off that cliff and now it feels super free, you know, and, and, um, a lot less pressure and a lot less worry. So that's awesome. Thank you. Melissa, thank you for being uh, a part of the conversation today. Where can we find you? Where can we find out more about your organization? Yeah, so we are the Adoption Connection. You can Google that and find all the things. On Instagram, we're at Post Adoption Resources. And then I'm also on Instagram, just at Melissa Corkum with a little underscore at the end. Cool. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, as a family with adoption in our story as well, I'm deeply grateful for that and appreciative of the need for what you do. So thanks so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom today. Well, thanks for having me, Trey. You bet.